Thank you for joining us for the discussion on our results for the half year ended September 38, 2019. Our results, including the investor presentation, press release, and regulatory disclosures, are already available on our website as well as that of the stock exchanges. I have with me Suresh Badami, Executive Director, Neeraj Shah, CFO, Srinivasan Pathsarthi, our appointed actuary, and Kunal Jain from Investor Relations. I will run through the key highlights of our H1 FI20 results and would be happy to take questions post that. Starting with an update on business performance. The half year ended September 2019 saw well-rounded performance across all key metrics. We have sustained the momentum gained in quarter one FY20. This has led to a significant expansion in our market share amongst the private insurers, increasing by 220 basis points from 13% in H1 FY19 to 15.2% in H1 FY20. We continue to rank number one amongst private players in terms of new business premiums with a market share of 22.4% in H1 FY20, which is an increase of 120 basis points. Our position within the group segment, which includes our credit protect business, remains strong with a market share of 28.9% in H1 FY20. We recorded strong individual APE growth of 37% in H1 FY20. In line with our commentary on our quarter one analyst call, individual APE growth moderated to 18% in quarter one FY20 on the back of a planned shift in product mix. We covered over 2.8 crore lives this quarter and our new business sum assured was rupees 4.4 lakh crores, which represents a growth of 33% and 68% respectively over the corresponding period. In terms of profitability, we have delivered a robust new business margin of 27.5%, an increase of 320 basis points from H1 last year. This is on the back of a healthy growth of 57% in the value of new business, which has increased from rupees 610 crores in H1 FY19 to 957 crores in H1 FY20. Our industry-leading new business margin was underpinned by a favorable product mix and continued cost efficiencies. Our operating return on embedded value was 19.6%. Despite a 37% growth in individual APE that generated higher expense strain, profit after tax grew by 10% to Rs. 733 crore. The PAT growth was aided by sustained profit emergence from our back book with growth of 29% in existing business surplus. Next, on channel performance. Diversifying our distribution mix has always been a key element of our strategy. We currently have over 270 partners, out of which more than 40 are new age ecosystem partners. Our agency channel witnessed solid growth of 80%, which included a notable growth of 32% in term protection. The agency channel now contributes to 15% of our individual APE as compared to 11% in the same period last year. A segmented agent recruitment strategy has helped us increase our new agent productivity by 44%. Our focus on ease of doing business for agents at higher agent engagement levels has resulted in the productivity of our frontline sales increasing by 84%. Our direct channel, which includes online, grew by 62% in H1 FY20. We have focused on a multidimensional approach with the aim of providing outreach to different customer segments. The half year also saw increasing adoption of various technological enablers. The channel saw its annuity segment grow by almost 40%, with term protection growth at 27%. In total, our proprietary channels grew by 69% on individual APE, with their share increasing uh, from 21% in H1 FY19 to 35% in H1 FY20. Our corporate distribution partners, which include bank assurance and brokers, grew by 24% in H1 FY20 on individual APE, with the broker channel growing by over 2x. This was achieved through close tracking of key business levers, namely activation and productivity across branches. We have also focused on growing our insurance offerings through our partner non-branch channels, such as virtual relationship management, VRM, and NRI channels, and this resulted in them contributing nearly 15% in certain relationships. As communicated in our earlier call, we continue to expand our distribution through our new age ecosystem partners. Our partnership with Airtel is progressing well. We have sold over 30 lakh policies through this partnership, and the policy can be issued in less than one second to the customer. Our collaboration with Paytm is another such exciting opportunity. The entire buying journey can be completed in just three clicks. We have sold over 7.7 .7 lakh policies till date through Paytm. Moving on to product performance, we continue to grow profitably with our focus on maintaining a balanced product mix. 
A savings business which includes unit link, par and non-par segments grew by 39% in H1 FY20. Protection continues to be a key focus area for us with our product suite adequately catering to the three pillars of protection, namely mortality, mobility, and longevity. Protection and annuity comprises 43% of our business in terms of new business premiums. Total protection APE has grown by 43% to Rs. 580 crores in H1 FY20. Individual term protection trended up to 6% of individual APE in H1 on the back of a strong quarter two. Total protection received premium in H1 FY20 was 2,225 crores, registering a YOY growth of 23% based on new business premiums. The annuity business for H1 FY20 stood at 1,223 crores, registering a YOY growth of 18% based on new business premiums. We continue to be enthused by the prospect of providing retiral solutions to our customers. This includes empanelment of corporates and introducing new product variants whilst ensuring appropriate pricing and risk management. The share of non-par savings has trended down from 58% in quarter one to 51% on individual APE in quarter two, with our exit run rate at 41% in September. We look forward to introducing new products across customer segments in H2. Our credit protect business has grown at 21% despite tough market conditions faced by NBFCs. This has been possible due to one, our diversification across partners in the traditional as well as new ecosystem space, two, spread across lines of businesses ranging from home loans to smaller ticket lending by MFIs and small finance banks, and three, improving value penetration and attachment rates. Next, on operations and technology as key differentiators, a 13-month persistency in individual business saw an increase from 83% to 86%. A 61st month persistency has significantly improved to 53% from 49% in the previous year. We continue to invest in technology so that it remains a key differentiator for us. For instance, one, with regards to service simplification, we have over 150 bots deployed across various functions managed by Superbot, which has processed over 138 million transactions in FY19. The implementation of these bots has resulted in significant improvement in turnaround times as well as elimination of non-value added activities. Two, on the sales and servicing front, we have deployed Insta. Insta is a virtual assistant that leverages AI, ML, and NLP technologies to answer product and process-related questions for our sales and operations teams. This helps improve service levels for the customers. It currently handles over 12 lakh queries per month with an accuracy of around 99%. Three, we have improved search efficiencies and reduced our acquisition costs through machine learning, which has led us to achieve 84% incremental leads and a 46% reduction in the cost per lead. To conclude, we are pleased to have maintained our solid, solid performance across all key metrics while maintaining the core elements of our long-term strategy, namely profitable growth, diversified distribution, and customer centricity. The detailed disclosure on our results is available in our investor presentation. In the end, I would like to thank all of you for your continued support of our company. We are happy to take questions now. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may please press star, then one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star, then two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. To ask a question, please press star, then one. The first question is from the line of Prakash Kapadia from Anivit PMS. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking my question and congrats on a good set of numbers. So I had two questions. Uh, as we step in the second half, you know, last year we had a low base. Obviously, we've done uh, uh, very well in the first half. So what kind of, you know, AP momentum are we seeing? And specifically, if you could comment on ULIP, what trends are we seeing? Yeah, hi. Uh, so, so your two questions. Uh, the growth, we are fairly uh, positive about growth in second half, just as first half has been. Uh, and reason for this is, uh, you know, despite what's happening macro and BFCs, et cetera, that I mentioned, insurance is seen as a safe haven a product. And also, more importantly, uh, HFC Life has, um, for at least the last three years, been very um, focused on other than uh, just savings-related products. 
Uh, we do that too, but also the focus on protection, annuities, retirees, etc., has helped. And so, when we have a discussion with prospective customers, it's not just about what's happening in the market and uh, whether it's just a savings product uh, with a fairly low level of life cover. And that has really helped us uh, and held us in good stead. And we expect that to happen um, and continue to happen in the uh, at least uh, in quarter three. Just given that there does not seem to be any signs of this volatility in the overall macro environment going down. You know, Vipa, if you could also comment in terms of cross-sell, what is oh, the ratio? Excuse me, this is the operator. I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. Mr. Kapadi. May we request you to use the handset, please? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm saying in terms of, you know, cross-sell ratio, what is the ratio? current ratio, where are we, and what are we trying to increase this, and with, you know, technology and no partner tie-ups, yeah. what kind of cross-sell are we witnessing? Yeah, so very good question because really it's uh, a focus on the farming and not just the hunting which uh, typically Indian life insurance has been focused on. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've been putting out uh, some slides even last quarter we did where about 8-odd uh, percent was, uh, was the cross-sell opportunity that we uh, continued to trend upward. Uh, also, this um, Insta, uh, sorry, uh, in terms of Insta Insure, which is what we earlier used to call it pre-approved summer assured, uh, and this is really piggybacking on our existing partners and their their customer their customers who are also our customers to say that with a three-click journey uh, and with very minimal pain, uh, you can also, by the way, get covered for various things, uh, and that's beginning to catch on big time because uh, it's a very different kind of an uh, instant value proposition that we're able to. Uh, put out. Of course, there is risk management um, and also data security. So all of those things are taken care of, and yet we are able to connect various data points, digital data points, to be able to give that uh, upsell to the customer. We also have through 360 degree view of the customer again through the use of um, big data, and also we have uh, we're in the process of going live on uh, on cloud cloud solutions uh, will enable us to know that this customer, what is the family view, what is the family. Uh, net worth, uh, where he or she might be in the life cycle, and hence to be able to uh, ping the customer with the right product at the right time uh, with minimal pain. And that's beginning to happen in a big way. Okay, and this Insta Insure is uh, for tier 3, tier 4, or not necessary? Not necessary at all. In fact, it is beginning with uh, tier 1 with Metro's. Okay. Thanks. All the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management is able to address questions from all participants in this conference call, please limit your questions to two per participant. If you have any further questions, you may come back for a follow-up. The next question is from the line of Nitin Agarwal from Motila Loswal. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations on uh, good results, man. Thank you. Uh, I have a few questions. Like, uh, firstly, the share of broker channel for us has been increasing very well like over the last one year. So how do you see the profitability mix of this channel? And if you can also share the product mix, like what sort of products are best suited to be sold through this channel? Yeah, so a couple of things. Uh, and it has been uh, a long journey for us in terms of our broker, cha uh, broker channel. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, slide 16, while we have not called it out separately, um, because it is uh, small in the whole scheme of things. But largely, our broker channel, um, along these same lines, uh, sells um, uh, non-power and participating products, so very little or next to no unit link. Uh, they are now beginning to focus on term as well. So highly profitable channel, uh, but we had to do a lot of things to shrink this channel before we it started really uh, doing very well. Uh, and now our focus has largely been in uh, in face-to-face -face brokers rather than in tele. Uh, and uh, we see that this being a niche space, uh, we see very high levels of persistency uh, with uh, certain partners that we work with, and these are very valued relationships that we have. Sure, you want to add? Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, broadly the broker channel has been focused on the tele venue as well as the face-to-face -face branches. I think what we have realized is very clearly it has to be one, the product fit on the customer, the quality of the business that we get in, and who are the key partners that we work with. And I think our focus effort has been in terms of engagement with some of these key partners on the technology side as well as looking at products which are best fit. So you will find the business growing as they grow because they are also expanding, they are increasing the number of branches. So we will continue to grow. It's just that we want to remain focused on the quality of business. All right. And uh, secondly, the persistency uh, in the protection business now, they have been like a 
in a, in a range that's pretty stable and it's very close to what it is in the traditional savings business at the long end, uh, yes. the fifth month persistency. Yes. So now with rising risk awareness as to why is it not like improving? Are you seeing customers churning to newer term policies as protection pricing has been on a decline over the recent years? Um, I, I think that over a period of time, uh, customers will start realizing that it's not their, not in their interest uh, to churn. Uh, whether churn is happening right now, I don't think it's really churn. I think it's more in terms of lack of awareness. We're not uh, that worried about churn because a customer, by the time he starts thinking of churn, perhaps might be two or three uh, years uh, uh, further down than when he bought it. And it's possible that some one of the two or three lifestyle illnesses is something that he might um, start showing signs of, which would mean that he he could get rated up, and so it's not really easy to uh, to shift. I do think that it's more in terms of lack of awareness, um, and also some confusion in terms of some brand, some claims on um, some percentage of claims, etc., which is again can be fairly confusing because, and I'll just explain that. Where in two companies, which which uh, some of the newspapers report to have different claims ratio, it's really macro at the company level. Uh, some a company like HFC Life that's been selling term for quite some time, uh, several more years than uh, peer group perhaps, might have a larger proportion of back book of uh, term business, which could be showing uh, various claims uh, outcomes. Some of them uh, we need to investigate, so which we, we might hold back. It might uh, appear optically that uh, the, the claims. Uh, repudiation might be slightly higher, etc. So, which comes back to my my original point. So, it's more in terms of educating the customer rather than necessarily churn, just for the sake of churn. And in any case, the higher value term will also mean fresh medicals for the customer if you have to do proper underwriting. So, you know, there may be a little bit of churn happening, but then the customer has to go through because we're fairly stringent in terms of what kind of medical checks have to be done for the high value cases. Right. So really, uh, we believe that this whole focus on uh, pure term will take at least the next three, four years before really a credible experience and pattern emerges, especially companies that have just started. Okay. And thirdly, on the VNB margins, like where do we see this hitting now that the 1Q, uh, we have seen the impact of Sanjay Plus playing out and 2Q, we have seen some normalized levels. Yeah. So is, is, will 2Q be the trajectory to expect on margins or maybe the new products that we are looking to launch are is further going to bump it up? So, you know, we've always said that for us, a smooth upward curve is something that, uh, um, you know, for us, it, it, we are, that's something that we are working on and it is very important. Profitable growth is important. So we see that a smooth upward curve continuing to, to pan out. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Ajax Henry from BNK Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, hello, ma'am. Thanks for the opportunity. My question is with respect to term again. Uh, why are we growing slightly lower than the competition, at least for the people who have uh, released reports term, retail term? Yeah, so if you look at, I think it's more in terms of the percentage that optically it looks lower. But if you look at just the um, the, the growth, that growth is 43%. We've had a much higher base. So it's off a higher base. The growth is uh, is quite robust. Uh, but as a percentage of, just given the um, offtake of uh, Sanchez Plus, our non-power flagship product in quarter one, which we launched in March of last financial year, uh, so optically it looks like as a percentage uh, term uh, has has gone down. Uh, and also, as you know, term uh, ticket size is much lower. But if you look at just the the growth, uh, that is, you'll agree that at a 43% growth, uh, it is more than robust. Uh, man, uh, you can give me the number of policies which are in force, uh, term policies. We will get back to you on that number. Uh, okay, okay, ma'am. And one more question on persistency. Uh, ma'am, why is the persistency without uh, single premium? So the way we look at this number is that uh, persistency is entire part of the our entire part of the business. Uh, even in terms of margin, we've had variants of margin wherein sometimes parts of the denominator are left out because uh, some part of group funds business, for example, is left out or a, a five pay is treated differently than uh, had it been a regular premium pay, uh, payment, etc. So instead of, um, you, you know, you show it as a smaller number so that your, perhaps so that your uh, margin is, uh, is higher. These are all very um, memo kind of numbers. Uh, the only version of 
uh, tracking for us is the regulatory version, and we are uh, we uh, we are very much compliant with the way regulators ask us to track it. And uh, our margins are uh, taking the actual center picture. Yes, it is completely uh, actual expenses. Um, it was actual expenses forever. Uh, and uh, it will start like first half is actual, and second half is. Uh, this is why I said forever. Yeah. For every okay. reporting period, uh, our expenses are actual. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. For the Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nishin Chavati from Kota. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, two questions. Uh, one was, uh, you know, if I look at the sensitivity analysis for FY19, and I really try to compare it with uh, first half FY20, uh, then we can see some change, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, of the impact for change in reference rates, or for that matter, persistence. Any any color that you can give as to why that has changed. And and this is on the EV side, so it's on the outstanding book. So Nishant, uh, just to uh, confirm the number that you are looking for, you are talking about FY19, 1% increase, uh, having a negative 1.7% change in EV. That's right. Right, versus uh, in, in H1, um, the minus 1.4%. That's right. Yeah, so, uh, and Srini can add, uh, a large part of this is because of us having sold a lot more of non-power book, which is fully hedged. So really, it has no interest rate impact or next to no interest rate impact um, on overall. And we have cost that. validated yeah. by external consultant also. Uh, and I know we checked uh, how closely the cash flows are attached, and it has been uh, validated by external uh, yeah. firms as well. Uh, so it just reflects uh, how closely matched our assets and liability cash flows are. Therefore, uh, you know the impact on um, our EV on one percent change in the reference status has not been, you know, and it's been like that for some time. It's not this quarter we are showing something. It's been like that for. Uh, no, as long as I can remember. Also, um, the unique part in HFC life, Nishin, as you know, is that uh, because of balanced product mix going back at least five, six years, uh, there are different pools of assets. So the asset liability profile as well as debt equity profile underlying is very different and often are complementary and are uh, and our uh, internal hedges. And hence, you will find uh, these kind of much lower numbers because of this unique advantage. Uh, on the persistency side? So on the persistency side, the proportion of the single premium book is increasing in the EV. So therefore, you'll oh. see a gradual reduction in the uh, sensitivity of uh, due to persistency. Because uh, the EV is no longer susceptible to whether a person pays or not in terms of his future premiums. Because of higher, higher single premium book. That's correct, yeah. So sure. the value has already come in. And also the lapse rate uh, is very, very small compared to regular premium, la premium lapse rate. And now if I look at the, uh, you know, percentage change in VNB column and if I look at acquisition expenses, uh, then does it mean that because you have higher margin products, uh, you know, the impact of uh, acquisition expenses on VNB is relatively lower? It's gone down from 18% to 13%. Sorry, which one are you referring to? 13. Huh. So I'm looking at acquisition yeah. expenses and now I'm looking yeah, at the yeah. VNB column. Yeah, that's, that's right, Justin. So basically it's on a higher base. And uh, also where the business is actually coming from, which uh, basically determines the sensitivity of acquisition expenses uh, on BNB. Sure. Uh, the second one is, uh, you know, I'm just trying to look at, the, you know, we're still try trying to reconcile the breakup of numbers. But uh, was there a marked increase on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis in the individual protection business for you? Uh, yes, yes, there was. was yeah. From Q1 to Q2, there has been a significant uh, increase in individual protection. Uh, mm -hmm. a percentage. And that is because? We've been really focusing on protection. You know, first quarter, really, um, the blockbuster product that we had uh, in terms of Sanjay Plus uh, was really full of the market, if you like. Uh, and uh, we kind of reined it in as well as went back to our, our roots of focus, focusing on protection, amongst other things. Uh, and that was clearly uh, a very good outcome in quarter two. And uh, consequently, group protection has also gone down. I mean, has gone down. So group protection is uh, credit, on quarter, I'm saying. credit protect is uh, grown at 21%. Group term has been a fairly, uh, you know, we've been running it uh, based on how the experience really pans out. So we're not really targeting any particular uh, growth number from a group uh, protection. Yeah, group protect nation quarter one was 21%, quarter two was 22%, was almost the same. Credit protect. And, and there again, group term, our focus has been to ensure that we stay for profitable quotes. Um, so, group term here is employer-employee course they are referring to. So, group term is different from credit protect. 
Yeah. On yeah. GTI, it really depends on the deals that are coming through, and like Suresh was saying, it depends on whether it's profitable. We do walk away from deals that are just a top line game, and uh, so that tends to be lumpy. Okay, and, and that was possibly a little lower in the second quarter. Yeah, yeah. I think which was okay. Was, I think it was. Yeah. It, it wasn't. I mean, I'm just uh, comparing. I'm just, I'm just comparing sequentially. Yeah, so our GTI actually, uh, if I were to look sequentially, grew 108% in quarter one and grew 384% in quarter two. So we'll maybe give you the breakup separately. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. But these are very small numbers, Nishit. Fair, fair point. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of others from Namura. Please go ahead. Hi everybody. Uh, question on the um, on the margin side. Um, I uh, don't see a material change in the business mix uh, uh, in uh, the first half versus the first quarter, and we've had a change in the VNB margin from 1Q to uh, 1H. While we've, we've we've guided and indicated that things will normalize, uh, this quarter is not a quarter where you've actually had a big shift in business mix. So if you can just uh, walk through what would have led to the uh, you know uh, delta in margins. So uh, there's uh, delta margins as we spoke about in Q1. Uh, also mm -hmm. Q1 was largely as you saw 60% plus growth with uh, mm -hmm. a new product and just coming in. And uh, in Q2 we've had uh, both these elements uh, moderate as per our expectation. So you've seen mm -hmm. both moderate to 18%, which basically impacts the operating leverage uh, quantum, which you see on. Mm -hmm. Uh, second last column, right? And yeah. uh, uh, what you did mention in terms of the change in product mix, uh, though 58% uh, uh, non-power savings in the quarter one and 51% uh, in quarter two. And all of it came at different points in time, right? And the interest rates uh, have been changing as well and the, uh, our ability to reprice at different points in time based on there will be an execution lag of a few weeks uh, both on yeah. the annuity side as well as on the uh, Sunset Plus side. So both of these would actually have, uh, uh, would result in this impact, which we had spoken about in Q1 itself, right? So from 29.8% to 5.3% uh, in Q2 on a standalone and 27.5% uh, for H1. So it's, it's honestly uh, in line with, exactly in line with what we've been expecting, both in terms of scale, uh, as well as in terms of the product mix shift, and the third aspect in terms of dynamic pricing required for both these product categories. To add one other point, Adish, is that, uh, so, so one vector is, uh, is product mix, which is what you're alluding to. But the other very important one is also the segments, uh, the channels through which we sell. Uh, and that mix also comes into play uh, on quarter two versus quarter one. And some of it is also that because your question that how is it that margins have dropped without uh, that much of change in the product mix, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, that, so that is also a factor in terms of, uh, and we're looking at really smaller time frames. When you look at it over the full year, uh, it will be a lot more meaningful than something specific that has happened in a particular quarter. Uh, so to, just to give you a sense that uh, if I were to uh, look at our uh, broker channel, for example, it you know grew 200% in the first quarter, it grew 274% in the second quarter. So these nuances will, will our online channel, for example, grew 162% in the first quarter and 117% in the second quarter. So, um, so it's also the co cost of acquisition of that channel along with the product mix. So there are different uh, variations like that. Uh, another aspect is, for example, uh, the point with that earlier caller was, uh, I think Nishin talked about, wherein um, if you're selling more firm and more protection, I also have stamp duty costs, for example, hitting me in a particular quarter than would have been in quarter one. So it is a little bit more involved in terms of uh, impact on margin. Understood. And uh, the second question, just want to check, uh, just just trying to compute the numbers on the non-par guaranteed book, right, uh, from from your individual product mix. It broadly looks like you would have sold similar amount of Sanche kind of products uh, in uh, 2Q uh, versus 1Q. Is that a fair... Uh, 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 fair yes and no, because... Because if you look at slide 16... Uh, and that's where we've given. We've also given Q2. It optically looks like non-power savings hasn't really moved that much, 54% to 51%. Uh, but like I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, the exit rate in September was 41% uh, and trending downwards. So you will find that that as the exit rate in March, we are targeting anywhere between 35 to 38%. 
understood no i was no that, that's understood and uh, last thing is again we'll go back to the same uh, thing majority of this line would be sanchai right yes uh, yes sanchai yeah. plus Sanj- and yeah. sanchai yes. sanchai also and sanchai plus sanchai was the variant one Correct. Uh, different variants. So basically, Q1 it was 58%, right? Q2 yeah, was 51%. Yeah. So that 7% is is a fairly significant shift in in one quarter. And like we yeah. just said, it's for different different points in time in the quarter, right? Correct. 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 Understood. Perfect. Uh, thanks a lot. This is helpful. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Raj Rishi, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, man. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Raj. Yeah, some uh, views of the trajectory of the sector. What sort of growth do you see uh, planning out the next years for the whole sector, and secondly for the private sector? And there's another question. Like uh, I believe the LIC policies are guaranteed by the government, right? So if 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 and when uh, suppose LIC is listed, I believe the guarantee will go away. So how do you see uh, that impacting the private players? Uh, like if, if you can give some comments on these, thanks. So I think there here there are lots of assumptions. I really don't know which way whether it's going to do an IPO and whether the guarantee will go away. So I think uh, we are focused as a, a private player on on the on the entire opportunity that is ahead of us, and there's room for all players, all 24 players to grow. Uh, and I, we are very convinced about that. And and all the macro data anyway show how underpenetrated insurance is, and especially the younger population as well as um, you know much deeper uh, penetration into India. um and also if you look at the data the private sector uh, gained higher market share for the first time in fi 16 uh, mm-hmm. that is when the regulate the regulatory changes and then were behind us and the inflection point happened wherein there was decoupling with just um a close correlation to uh, where sensex was so what mm-hmm. was beginning to emerge was that there's a uh, there's there are several several things uh, that finally um result in whether customer buys and what he chooses and not just the market and the, and that's really the um uh, growing up of the sector uh, wherein uh, companies like hdfc life uh, were very very convinced that we have to cover one of the risks if not more than one so either mortality morbidity longevity or interest rate risk and some mm-hmm. combination thereof and so the the nature of the products being sold started changing their color gradually but uh, you know in a very uh, clear manner um okay. so, you'll, so you'll see then that's and that's also the reason why insurance as an industry has done um reasonably well uh, when you look at individual wrp growth uh, for the first uh, uh, half of the year 11% growth and private did better at 16% growth so that mm-hmm. growth is a fairly respectable growth uh, versus what's happening in the overall uh, environment so we okay. see with the continued bearishness we would see insurance as an industry continuing to track better than other financial services Okay 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 thanks a lot thank you so thank you thank you the next question is from the line of suresh ganpati from macquarie please go ahead yeah hi we have two questions one is um, the sustainability of your back book growth i mean it's been pretty impressive at about back book surplus i mean it's about 29% uh, do you think you know you have enough reserve releases which can happen and you know all these protection policies that you have sold over the years to sustain this current momentum hopefully and and i'll tell you why i'm saying that suresh and that is because uh, the major factors for this back book uh, unwinding of the the profits that we have written or really not, this is nothing but a whiff unwinding into i gap profits and let's see as to what is it dependent on it's dependent uh, on couple of things one is persistency assumptions mortality assumptions and expense assumption of course there is interest rate as well um, but these are the large assumptions and given that our operating variance over several years has been very close to our assumptions so actuals are very close to our assumptions means that all things being equal whatever business we have written in, in the terms of whiff should unwind over the next few years as indian gap profits no but then the rate has been way ahead of competition as i know none of them disclosed it yeah. but on a reported profitability basis obviously nobody is close in the terms of the way the growth has happened yeah. so clearly in your case the back book has contributed much more if, if we were to interpret in that way right so how do you justify i mean because everybody is seeing a positive opening way of operating variances or a mortality charges among the peers yeah the yeah. reason there for each is one other thing if you look at the wif our wif is about 67% 66 67% of our ev while if you look at a lot of companies especially smaller companies the wif uh, will be a lot smaller net worth will be larger so while ev looks like a good number really the wif accretion uh, is a lot smaller and reason the wif accretion is a lot smaller is because the 
perhaps gone in for a top line driven strategy so the wisp build up has been the pace of wisp build up is heavily dependent on the new business margins um mm -hmm. so new business margins is one your expenses uh, maintenance costs uh, those sorts of thing but largely new business margins so given okay. that you know if we have been we we crossed the 20% very long ago in terms of business margins that has aided to our wisp build up the key is wisp build up okay sir and you know of course we have talked a lot on these guaranteed products i don't want to name the competitor but we just had a meeting today with one of your competitors and this is what their thought process was you know if you are going to give a guaranteed return of about 6 and a half percent on your product and 50% of the product has to be invested compulsorily in government securities which yield only 7% which means which means you know and if you add a distribution cost of about 2% the effective return that you have to generate on your book is 8% which means in the balance 50% of the book the return needs to be generated is even higher than 9% to arrive at a 6 and a half percent or a whatever 6% tax free return to an investor all these economics makes it very difficult to go ahead and try to justify launching these guaranteed products and maybe the assumption here is that a lot of these things is compulsorily reliant on higher lactation because the higher is the lactation the better is the surrender profit and eventually you are cross subsidizing your a uh, non profitable customer or a profitable customer is non profitable is that true is that logic wrong somewhere so suresh that logic might be uh, right for someone wanting to enter ab initio now uh, the thing with us is that we have been uh, working on this product now for the last 24 months so we have an inv at that time itself uh, we have been accumulating assets so we have an inventory of high yielding assets against which we are writing new business so for us that is really not uh, an issue based on the math that you have quite rightly talked about so there is a unique advantage second unique advantage is that because of our balanced uh, product mix over the years what we have in our 1.3 trillion assets under management are also uh, assets with uh, asset liabilities with very different um, um, profiles you know in terms of duration and so our Uh, the business that we intend writing and which we have written under non par uh, savings we have other assets whose liability profile is more short term so we can utilize uh, sanjay plus or this non par products to pay that off while the underlying assets uh, in that asset class can be utilized for this for paying over the long term so which is what the interest rate sensitivity that we have put out on slide 22 shows virtually zero impact on margins next quarter suresh because we didn't have enough time we've had this again just for the sake of uh, giving further comfort we've had an external uh, leading uh, actuarial firm um uh, review our numbers and the entire strategy uh, and uh, there is zero risk is what they have given us a report Can you share the persistency numbers in this product category? Now, we pass it as positive. So a little bit early because we haven't completed a year. But when we when I look at um, quarterly and monthly, absolutely um, high levels of persistency. So the the counter that some industry uh, peers are talking about that this is lack supported is absolutely untrue. And even the sensitivity um, review that this leading firm has done shows that at hundred percent. Uh, persistency level we are still there is zero alm mismatch and so uh, just to add to that uh, the, the bit that you started off with in terms of the yields that are actually uh, translating into customer returns so we we had discussed this earlier as well so uh, the thing is uh, these investments uh, today the g sec rates are what they are uh, when the investments uh, have been started uh, was about 100 150 basis points depending on uh, which uh, which uh, part of the curve you're looking at uh so uh, basically between what we earned and what we are promising to the customers uh, we've repriced it a couple of times since the time we launched it and the spread okay. that we are uh, maintaining based on all the assumptions that we spoke about is enough to meet our margins expenses as well as uh, on a risk adjusted basis uh, get to the alm uh, situation that we want both on cash flows and on sensitivity so okay fine yeah. Suresh, in fact, while you're on the call, at one point that I wanted to make, actually, while there's a lot of focus on non-par savings, I would also urge a fair amount of focus on this uh, on annuity repricing, because what we do find is that even after cuts in rates, there is a um, almost a four-five month lag before annuities are repriced, uh, and that really, in our mind, is a very big risk uh, and very aggressive in terms of. Um, Uh, giving out those rates and there you will find that in this financial year in 6 months we have repriced four times um and which is part of the reason why our annuity business in quarter 2 has been flat um because of us not wanting to take aggressive calls on interest rates cool thanks so much viva thank you
Thank you. The next question is from the line of Avinash Singh from SBI Cap Securities. Please go ahead. Avinash Singh from SBI Cap Securities. Your line is unmuted. Please go ahead with the question. Hello. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, the first one was on unwind. Again, I would not go on quarter to quarter. Of course, there is volatility, but even look at the first half. The unwind rate has come down meaningfully versus last year. Yes, uh, there has been a sort of a fall in uh, yields. But in, I mean, uh, uh, typically this unwind has two components, your the risk-free rate and the expected real-world rate above your uh, reference rate. Now, the thing is that, okay, can this change so dramatically, I mean, quarter or quarter? Your unwind rate was too low in Q1. In Q2, of course, it has uh, improved, but still on a half yearly basis, it is dramatically or materially lower than what has been the trend uh, over the last year. So that's one. And second question, more on business. I mean, if I were to look at individual, uh, you are selling more uh, protection, so definitely uh, there should be uh, increasing number of policies. But overall, individual number of policies for the first half are down. So, I mean, what sort of a tra uh, underlying factors behind this sort of a uh, falling uh, uh, policy count. So, these are so Avinash, let me take the second question first and Srini can answer the first one. The, on the second question on NOPs, so if I were to, uh, from the base, uh, exclude our uh, very small ticket health policies that we sold uh, last uh, last year, first half, uh, because they were very low levels of persistency, um, my uh, increase in uh, number of policies is actually 6%. It's still lower than what we would like, uh, but some of that is also because of the uh, effect of larger ticket size um, uh, sale of Sanjay Plus. That, like you're seeing even in quarter two in terms of course correction, that's beginning to happen. So we're not that uh, worried about because there is a focus on getting that number up. So really the base effect of uh, health is causing it to look optically like it is flat. Srini, you want to... So on the first one, I think, um, yeah. uh, Avinash, uh, the first one on the unwind rate, so we basically start with the, since we publish MCEV uh, numbers, so the MCEV numbers, you have to pay, uh, start with the yield curve, and there is no subjectivity in getting the yield curve, so that, that's the risk free yields prevail in the market at the time. Uh, so, and that is resulting somewhere between 7.5% or so to 7.5% or 8% uh, for the H1 of this year. Uh, so, we basically take the uh, risk-free curve and unwind at the same, at the prevailing rate with a little bit of expectation added to it. Uh, since the outlook now for the yields are to sort of, you know, uh, downwards, uh, we have allowed for that outlook also to be factored in the unwind calculations. But other than that, it's largely between 7 to 8% is what we used in between Q1 and Q, uh, Q2 as well. So we don't want to really wait till the end of the year to really do that. So our view on interest rates, like uh, on all other operating aspects of our business, we will like to reflect it uh, as and when we uh, think uh, it's, it's kind of uh, different from what is uh, the current uh, experience or the current uh, rates in this case. Yeah, so but if I... Again, look at the standalone quarters. I mean, in Q1, you have taken almost close to 7%, and if I just break Q2, it would come closer to 8%. So, I mean, from Q1 to Q2, I mean, yield curves have not really materially uh, gone up. I mean, I, of course, I know there will be variance across the tenors, but that's something that is the material difference between what you assumed in Q1 and now in Q2. So, is, I mean, does that explain by sort of a, your just the change, shift in yield curve, or you have tweaked or your expectation ever of that reference rate materially in these two quarters? So, see, Avinash, it's, it's basically uh, when we are uh, sitting on 30th September, we, we made certain assumptions on the way the yields were moving uh, in June. At June end, we had a certain expectation in terms of how the yields are going to move. We probably had a slightly more, uh, in, in, in terms of where the interest rates were headed, we probably had a, we, 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 we may have thought that the interest rates were maybe heading downwards faster than what they are at this point in time. That would have been done at the point of time in June. And September, where we are standing today, that, that we would have got uh, calibrated based on where we are sitting today. So it's, it's more a function of uh, as on date, as on June and as on September, not much in terms of uh, uh, what would have happened uh, intra-quarter, really. Uh, I mean, okay. okay, okay. And quickly, on that uh, Sancha Plus, I mean, margin from Q1 to Q2, I mean, uh, would margin have come a bit uh, down before you reprice the product for certain? I mean, your repricing would take some time, but yield curves are falling down. So would it be fair to assume that, okay, by the time you reprice, there would have been some sort of a pressure on that uh, margin of that uh, Sunshine Plus in Q2? 
Uh, yes, Avinash, and we did mention that in our uh, earlier conversation, maybe three or four callers ago, we, we did mention that that, that was, uh, in fact, I think it was others. So we, we did speak about that in terms of the pricing lag uh, between uh, when uh, the rates are uh, uh, panning out differently and our ability to reprice from an execution perspective. There, w there could be a few weeks uh, lag, uh, which could result in what you just said. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Harshit Toshniwal from Jefferies. Please go ahead. Hi, congratulations for a good set of numbers. I have two questions, ma'am. Uh, one, when we look at, uh, so as you said that we already in started investing in the long duration bonds earlier and we have a better product, uh, basically single premium product uh, suit which allows us to sell this Sanjay. Uh, is there any limit to which I can sell this product or maybe maybe another for three to four quarters which you plan because uh, in a way the kind of volumes which I'm running in this product is, is far more than the back book or basically credit protect or uh, annuity business which I'm generating. So I want to understand that how, till when can we uh, match this uh, risk, interest rate risk by our existing uh, product and the new cash flows? So Harshit, uh, there is no longer uh, any capacity constraint, not that there was even uh, in quarter one, but now uh, RBI has allowed FRAs also. Uh, right. Really, there isn't any constraint to, to write this business uh, to the extent that any company wants to write this business. Uh, okay, but even from an internal uh, company management perspective, so when I look at your AUM book, around 50,000 crore is a non-link book. If I exclude par uh, li par business, then it would be around 15, 20,000 crore of non-par, non-link book. Uh, is there any limit uh, or internally uh, where we would want to uh, restrict uh, this return guarantee business for the balance sheet? Yeah, so it is, it is lesser caused by a capacity constraint, but we just want to go back to basics wherein we always believe that uh, we want to follow a balance in whatever we do, and so balance distribution and balance product mix. So um, uh, in the, uh, hovering somewhere between 35 to 40%, 40% being an out, uh, outer level, is what we would like to uh, see our product mix on an ongoing basis. And Sanket, so, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, ahead, just yeah. to add to that, Sanket, uh, uh, what we've uh, mentioned, uh, Harshit, I'm sorry, uh, in terms yeah. of uh, what we've said on page 22, uh, the starting point really would be, the key thing would be basically what Baba mentioned in terms of the customer segment and how we want to really manage the product mix. The other end of the spectrum would be uh, the risk management. So uh, in terms of if our uh, if our uh, intent is to actually match cash flows for Sunset Plus as a non-power savings plus uh, credit protect, that is something that would become, uh, uh, you know, something that we would monitor dynamically every month. Our ability to be able to do that, whether through internal hedges like uh, credits protect uh, business or through instruments, structured instruments such as partly paid bonds or now uh, in the case of uh, forward aid agreements, uh, our capacity would be actually determined by that on a collective basis, and uh, on the other end is basically the, our uh, intended product mix. So it would it would basically be uh, determined by both of these elements. Okay. And one more thing, if I may ask, so this is when I look at the public disclosures, so they give the duration of the investment book, non-link book. So what was surprising is that when I look at your duration, a kind of average duration of the non-link book versus other players, the two peers, uh, it is not very different. So your comes to around 9 to 10 years, and it was similar for even SBI and I2. So want to understand that our business being uh, mix being so different and a much more longer duration business mix uh, versus others, then why... Should should there be some difference in the duration of the bonds which we are holding? So, uh, Harshit, even a 35-year bond will have a duration of about 13 or 14 years, okay? So, 35-year bonds, you don't actually have an asset duration of 35 years. So, because the coupons, you know, it's a discounted mean term approach. So, when you calculate it using a DMT uh, formula, you actually end up with a 13 or 14-year duration for a 35-year GSEC bond. So, just because you have a 40-year bond doesn't mean the asset duration will be 40 years, if that's what your expectation is. And also in terms of matching the liability against it, we've always maintained that on a standalone basis to manage the liability duration of a non-power savings product is not uh, possible without any external hedge. So, it's uh, for, so far we've been doing it uh, through a combination. We'll continue to do so going forward as well, along with uh, supplemented with uh, other external instruments. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank, thanks a lot, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we, will, we would request you to please limit your questions to one per participant. For any further questions, you may come back for a follow-up. The next question is from the line of Ravi Naredi from Naredi Investments. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello, Vibha and Suresh uh, 
Thank you very much for your result. Yeah, hello. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In September 19 month, our premium come down in uh, compared to uh, April to August month. What is the reason behind it? So, couple of reasons here, Ravi. One is that uh, the uh, the base effect. So, last year we grew well. Uh, both in September and October. Second is that uh, last year when we grew well, it was on the back of uh, a lot more of unit linked uh, products that were sold, uh, especially uh, a flagship unit linked product at that time. And uh, based on a balanced product mix, we were not that keen to uh, follow that same uh, approach of selling a lot more of unit links, especially through bank assurance. So we had a calibrated uh, product mix resulting in a more muted September. So just September uh, overall when you look at uh, the degrowth was because of the base effect. Um, however, down the line, so once this base effect of uh, September is out of the way, uh, which it is now, uh, we've, uh, uh, we should be back on track on, uh, on robust growth. October has also last October had a little bit of spillover effect, but uh, beyond that, uh, it should be business as usual. Okay. And one more, uh, what is the unrealized gain on 30th September on our uh, investment? Um, uh, just allow us a moment, we're just pulling it out. Okay. So it is 1875, 1874 crores. 1874 crores. Yeah. Unrealized. It's an unrealized loss because of market movements. Okay. okay. Yeah, because the BSE 100 decreased by close to 200 basis points uh, versus the last uh, half year increased by uh, 600 basis points. So it is loss, 1874. Yeah, it's a fair value change. So it's not really a loss, but unrealized. Yeah, so fair value. Unrealized. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nishin Chavate from Kotak. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, no, just a question, uh, hygiene question that we ask everybody. Uh, is there anything in the debt uh, book that uh, we should be worried about or you envisage any provisions? So, uh, Nishin, uh, oh, apart from ILNFS, which is something that we have also mentioned in the past, um, based on current uh, uh, visibility, there has been no default um, on the debt securities that we are sitting and for which we have not provided. And some of the some of the bonds that we've been holding, NCDs we've been holding, they've been prepayments very recently. So uh, as of now, nothing to report on the debt side. Nothing that nothing that concerns you beyond whatever we have reported in the past. That's 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 correct, Ernest. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Hitesh Arora from Unify Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, ma'am, just, just a clarification, uh, the regulator had said that uh, banks may have to cut stake in insurance firms to below 30%. Uh, could you throw some light on that? I'm not sure uh, which regulator has said that, uh, apart from reading it in the newspapers. So, um, really, uh, it's something that makes a lot of sense, but uh, not sure that uh, I've actually seen any notification to that that effect. Okay, so there will be no formal notification to that uh, no, effect, not uh, either IRD or no, uh, RBI or... No, okay. no, Okay, uh, just one more question, please. On slide 15, I uh, just wanted to understand better how you classify your uh, pr uh, protection uh, products. You classify it as term protection as, and then you classify it as annuity. I would have thought that annuity would be more of a savings product, which you would classify under non-par. Uh, could you... Uh, so a little more light on this? Yeah, sure. So, you know, we've always talked about three tenets of protection. So, uh, mortality, which is the term part of it. Morbidity, health, it's very small, so we haven't shown it separately. And longevity is where annuity comes in, and hence showing annuity separately. Okay. Uh, but would that be uh, a protection product, per se, or is it... Uh no, we're showing it... Well, when we say protection, what we mean is that there has to be some risk transfer, and annuity products certainly have a risk transfer in terms of longevity. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vinayak Mota from G GHB Securities. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Uh, so I do have a small question. Excuse me. Uh, 
Excuse me, this is the operator. I'm sorry to interrupt. Mr. Motha, may we request to use your handset, please? Uh, your voice is echoing a lot. Hello? Yeah, is it fine now? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so I just had a small question. If we are looking at segment F in the segment reporting standards, the premium for that segment has gone down significantly in this quarter. So if we could throw some light on that part, the non-participating pension group variable. Yeah, so that's basically the annuity business. Uh, we, we just mentioned that uh, while the long-term opportunity is something that we completely believe in, uh, we, we want to ensure that uh, we balance growth with profitability and risk management. So whenever we actually need to reprice the annuity rate that we offer to customers, we will do that. And uh, depending on uh, uh, how the market is actually reacting to it, that could affect uh, in the short-term uh, basis how the uh, business really works, but uh, we do expect that uh, in the medium to long term there would be prudence that would uh, be used to offer bus uh, to write business in this segment, and uh, that's how we plan to write it uh, now as well as in the future. Okay, okay, that's just from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of M W Kim from J P Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, ma'am. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, number one question is about uh, your the new business, uh, the disclosure. So when you actually uh, look at the, the new business strain growth, actually the, there has been a big increase on the new business strain. So the, my question is, what is the major driver on this uh, new business strain growth? Is it more due to the commission or the or the leader being related with the non-par? That's my first question. Um, and then the second question is about the product mix. So if you're actually looking back to the last couple of years, the company actually has been most innovative in the, in the market, and then the lot of the changes makes that uh, your margin and then the product mix or the free surplus generation very different from the rest of the player. So m moving into the next three years, what would be the company's overall the product mix look like? Do we, do we expect that the, the current the non par product could continue to be the major product, or are you preparing the another or the more more series of the new product? Thank you. So MW, on the first part, uh, new business train, uh, the biggest driver of that is uh, the acquisition expense, and that is mm -hmm. a function of the growth, and also a function of mm -hmm. where the growth is coming from, both in terms of channels or in terms of products. So while the growth for H1 has been 37%, uh, uh, it has resulted in new business strain. Uh, the business mm -hmm. that we're writing are from profitable channels as well as uh, products, which is uh, ensuring that our new business margin is uh, fairly healthy, which we, we've spoken about. And also mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the way this uh, is supported by the surplus generated by the back book, we do expect on an ongoing basis to continue to generate that. Uh, as we write mm. the business and the unwinding of if that we spoke about earlier on the call. Uh, as far as uh, product mix is concerned, we, we've always maintained that mm. uh, we will continue to launch uh, new products in different segments, uh, and depending on how the customers uh, uh, react to those and the macroeconomic environment, uh, those products will uh, will take share from each other, while mm. uh, overall uh, basis uh, we would expect to grow as well. So, we, yeah, we do expect to launch uh, new products in different segments over the next few quarters. Uh, yeah, that's very clear. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Omkar Kulkarni, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hello. My question was regarding the how to value uh, the companies in the insurance sector. Uh, is it only about uh, EV or embedded value or uh, the profitability is also should be considered. Oh, so that's a, I think, uh, you know, you, you honestly you could ask your fellow uh, <laughs> colleagues on the call, they'd be better positioned to answer that. We, 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 we rather answer questions on uh, uh, the, the business, really. But uh, based on whatever we understand, it's, it's all of everything that you mentioned. It's uh, the growth, the quality of the growth, the economic value generated, as well as the accounting surplus emerging over a period of time. So all of these elements would uh, form a part of uh, the consideration set, uh, in my view. Uh, this is mostly to do with uh, because the growth in the profitability is comparatively lower than all other parameters.
So that's that's actually just the anomaly in the life insurance business where the accounting surplus uh, gets affected or distorted because of growth and uh, upfronting of uh, expenses. So uh, that's the reason why economic growth is something which is uh, given more uh, prominence uh, along with the growth and the quality of growth. So new business margins and the embedded value operating uh, profit is something which is uh, given significant weightage, uh, and, and we do that as management teams as well. But we also have a very keen eye on how the accounting surplus is emerging. We were mentioned earlier in the call in terms of how operating variances are panning out. That is equally important as well, because ultimately the economic value has to translate into uh, cash or near cash, which is basically uh, accounting profit. So, so what would be your say medium to long term guidance in terms of AB? So, so uh, as you know, we don't really give guidance uh, on any of uh, the, the, the metrics that uh, you, you spoke about. But uh, we do expect that uh, if you were to break down the components on new business margins, we do expect a smooth upward curve uh, on a going basis on new business growth. We've maintained that uh, we like to grow faster than uh, industry. If all of that pans out, then the rest of the things would follow as well. So at least you would be like try to hold on to this level. We believe we can uh, steadily uh, grow from here on all on all parameters. Okay, thanks. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We'll take the last question from the line of Neeraj Toshniwal from MK Global. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, congrats on the set of numbers. Uh, just uh, wanted to understand uh, in terms of margin movement, uh, can we attribute to what has led to uh, just because of the uh, distribution channel and what has led from com uh, what came from the uh, your movement in the interest rate yield because of the lag impact and uh, and uh, yeah, if if what what if if we have used the credit protect portfolio and uh, any any uh, let go of margin because of that use of that particular portfolio in our in our hedging of the Sanjay Plus. I'm in mix of uh, questions related to margin. Uh, so, Neeraj, you laid this out on uh, uh, this page of ENB, NBM walk through, right, from uh, basically 24.3 right up to 27.5. And uh, the biggest component there is uh, basically the growth uh, leading to the operating leverage. Uh, in terms of product mix, uh, business profile uh, also is a significant contributor to that uh, margin uplift. Uh, and... Uh, so it's, it's, it's both of these uh, elements. In terms of uh, pricing impact, yes, it would get netted off in uh, uh, the product level margins. And like we've discussed in the past, uh, we, we do not lend too much of uh, importance to product or channel level margins, uh, given that uh, it can be a function of allocation of expenses and also a function of uh, timing of business uh, generated by the channels. So uh, uh, it's, 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 it's more in terms of uh, the overall growth and uh, growth coming from channels which are uh, doing good quality business and generating a uh, uh, high level of uh, new business margin. Uh, we, we spoke about it earlier in the call in terms of agency. If you look at the product mix, you'll, you'll get a sense of that. If you look at online, uh, we spoke about the broker channel as well. So all of that would give you a sense in terms of uh, the, uh, the interaction between the channel and the product mix and also the, the operating aspects of uh, pricing lags that, 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 that you rightly alluded to. Okay. And any uh, let go of margin to use of uh, credit protect portfolio for anything Sanche Plus? Anything on that, if at all? So there again, you know, it's it's about how you look at it, right? Uh, credit protect on a standalone basis and credit protect uh, along with non-par uh, gives us a very, uh, it, 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 on a standalone basis, a profitable product category and serves a very strong customer need. When you club it with uh, uh, Sunshine Plus kind of a product, it addresses a need in the market and a sentiment like this, and it allows you to grow and generate margins all through a different product line. So we do not really see it as a subsidy coming from one aspect to another, especially given that it's both the non-power segments where the risk-reward profile from a shareholder perspective is, is absolutely the same. Uh, so the, the key aspects are in terms of how, do, how does Credit Protect help us manage growth, uh, profitability at a portfolio level, as well as uh, enable us to manage risk at a company level. So that's how we see the role of Credit Protect or any product uh, in our portfolio. Okay. So uh, uh, on the exit trend rate of uh, non-par, we have 35, 38 percent. On the overall, uh, do we have any uh, strategy or any number to how we are looking at? Because ULIP is still very low and there is stress in ULIP available there in the market. So are we looking at any particular mix or nearby, not necessary, or uh, maybe in a range if we can just have in the terms of mix we are looking at? So, yeah, yeah, we did, uh, we did speak earlier in the call. Our intent would be to get to uh, maybe... Uh, uh, the 25-30% mark on UNIP, 35 to 45% maybe on non-par, and 
uh, participating would be maybe in the 15 to 20 percent range, and the rest would be protection annuities. Okay, that that is very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That was the last question. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Vibha Patalkar for closing comments. Thank you. As mentioned, the detailed disclosure on our result is available in our investor presentation. I would like to thank you all for participating in this quarterly results call. Thank you.